capitalist show, the official rebel capitalist show, real estate expert. His name is Jason Hartman. He's a great buddy of mine. Jason, welcome back to the rebel capitalist show. Hey, George, it's great to be back with you. And we have got some updates, some big news and some surprising news. We're going to really I think we're going to surprise your listeners and, and viewers a little bit uh, today because uh, I think one of my predictions might be, uh, well, it might be wrong. Mm, okay. Well, you get a lot of predictions right. I know that. So you're mm-hmm. uh, you're okay to have one wrong every once in a while. But to start, Jason, let's go over kind of the macro real estate market in the United States, not necessarily for an investor, but just someone who has a home they might be thinking about selling, or maybe someone that's interested in buying a home right now. Yeah. As I've probably said before, or at least alluded to on your show, George, uh, you know, it is a tale of three markets. Right. Uh, and that is, I'm not going to say linear, cyclical, and hybrid, though, when I say that. <laughs> I usually say linear, cyclical, and hybrid. This time, I'm going to say a tale of three markets, but they do correspond, uh, at least roughly. I'm going to say urban, high density, uh, suburban, uh, lower density, and then rural, extremely low density. Okay. Okay. So you're so changing it up a little bit. Changing it up a little bit, but that does kind of correspond. And then also, I think we have to really look at the luxury home market versus the affordable home market. And the one thing that is surprising me is, uh, well, I guess I should back up uh, just before I even say that. A, a few months ago, I think probably all of us who were in the know thought the world was falling apart, okay? I mean, I certainly, you know, I knew that there would be this shift in 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 preferences from, you know, uh, urban city living, high density living to lower density suburban living. And that's right. coming true, okay? Right. But I really wondered, you know, I was watching so many of your awesome whiteboard videos and uh, and, you know, getting other news out there. And I really wondered, like, how sick is the economy? I mean, almost half the country is unemployed when we look at the U.S. Um, the, The curve was doing the exact opposite of flattening at the time when this sort of, you know, got really bad in the darkest Mm -hmm. days. Yeah. And um you know, the, the question is, what is more powerful? Is it more powerful for to have this migration trend shift? Um, and, you know, is that going to uh, overshadow the sickness in the economy? Right. And the sickness is definitely there. But then, of course, the powers that be have uh, uh, made us avoid the pain again. They won't let us take our medicine and truly heal and get cured of the disease. They keep kicking the can down the road with stimulus bailouts. And, and you're, you know, you're an expert at that. You talk about it all the time. Uh, so, so you got all these cross currents at play here. Yeah. That's what makes it complicated. It's complicated. Just like the, my favorite Facebook relationship status it's complicated. <laughs> that's the funniest one of all. I love that one. <laughs> that's that's no matter what kind of relationship I was in, I'd just say it's complicated because it's never <laughs> simple. It's a catch-all for you, right? <laughs> it's a catch-all, married, single, <laughs> you know, girlfriend, <laughs> divorced, widowed. It's always complicated. It doesn't matter, you know. Right. Uh, everything's complicated. But um, what what is amazing to me is not that the affordable market is booming. It is booming, and that's no surprise, no surprise at all, the affordable suburban housing. But what is amazing is that the luxury home market is taking off, too. And there are certainly a lot of people out there with money. Uh, The stock market's been at least temporarily rescued. There's a Band-Aid over the stock market, by and large. I mean, it has its up and down days, obviously. Uh, But the luxury home market is bouncing back with a vengeance, and that is a little surprising. I think most of it, George, is really just a repositioning of of people with money, with means, um, wanting to position themselves for the next quarantine, the next lockdown, and they want to be socially distanced. And they're doing that. Uh, oh, boat nice. sales are increasing. RV sales are increasing. Um, rural home uh, sales are increasing. Suburban homes are increasing. Uh, the only thing that is in bad shape is high-rise and mid-rise uh, living. 
Mm, okay, so that makes sense. That goes back to why you're kind of looking at the markets a little differently right now and dividing it into the urban, the suburb, and the more rural areas. So, so the urban is what's really getting hit, and the, the suburb and rural, even on the high end, seems to be doing all right. Yeah, yeah, we're doing better than all right. I mean, just a few days ago, um, one of our markets, we opened uh, uh, a new market with a really good builder uh, client that we had, uh, and they had a few different markets in Alabama, brand new construction homes. We did a webinar on it. Our clients started buying them like crazy. And then uh, an institutional buyer, a hedge fund, came in and bought 53 of the properties, completely wiped out our inventory in one swoop. Um, we, we had to close the entire market in, you know, it's going to take quite a while for that supply to come online again. Now, those are, you know, a hundred and maybe $180,000, uh, to about $270,000 brand new construction homes in a few different markets in, in Alabama. And, and they're completely gone. We have nothing to sell there. Um, uh, you know, but one, one swoop, you know, 53 properties are gone and it takes a while for the builder to catch up and resupply that. Um, and yeah. we, we see this everywhere. People are buying properties, uh, like crazy. And what's counterintuitive about that, George, is that, you know, three months ago, I, I don't know. I, I said to one of my investment counselors, you know, we might have to make some hard decisions, uh, in the next few months. And to the contrary, at least right now, uh, I mean, Business is booming. It's but are we seeing that with just the investment side or are we seeing that with owner occupants? And if we're seeing it with owner occupants, where are they getting the money? If half of the United States or if we've got 20, 30 million Americans unemployed, new people unemployed, and that's, and I think the unemployment numbers are understated just like the CPI, but that's a topic yes. for another video. But yeah. where are these people getting the money for the down payment? Well, remember, it's very uneven. Um, a lot of the people that were uh, most severely affected were people that really weren't homeowners anyway, or potential homeowners even. Mm, I mean, okay. you know, if you look at the service industry and in hospitality, you know, people that work in hotels and restaurants and, you know, various tourism, these aren't very highly paid jobs, okay? And they're not digital jobs. So, uh, you know, they're, they're not the kind of knowledge workforce, right? Um, but they do make the world go round. So I want to give those people a lot of respect because let me tell you something, the, the Uber Eats delivery driver and, uh, you know, the people working in the grocery stores, if we didn't have those people, society really would have collapsed by now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so thank God that they're out there. Uh, but, you know, a lot of these people that were most severely affected really weren't in the, the real estate market anyway, right? So mm -hmm. it's not, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's the old uh, rich get richer, poor get poorer. Uh, sadly, it, it's just the way of the world. Uh, it's a very uneven um, kind of situation we have right now. Give us some insights on the rent side. You said that's yeah. a mixed bag. Can you explain that further? It is a mixed bag. And um, the institutional apartment complexes in many markets, rents are softening. Okay. So everybody okay. should really know that. And those um, were really overbuilt too. They were overbuilt for sure. Uh, but also uh, people are, when, when, the, when the first lockdowns lifted, people started to move. And that's when the great American move, uh, you know, really started happening. And they were leaving those higher density uh, living uh, environments uh, to get further away. A lot of them were working at home anyway. And, you know, if you're on a Zoom call or a Skype call, it doesn't matter if you're five miles from work or 500 miles from work. It, right. It's irrelevant. Okay. So, People have discovered, uh, as we've talked about before, George, that you really can live anywhere as long as you have an internet connection uh, and, a, and a decent one. And so people have, have begun that mass migration. I call it the Grapes of Wrath 2020 after John Steinbeck's famous novel about migration uh, right. during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. And um, 
so that's happening. Uh, and, and you do see some, uh, some deterioration in rents in the institutional apartment buildings. Now, here's the thing that's hard to tell, and you really got to tease out, uh, you know, the facts here. Okay. And, and here's what it is. Residential single family homeowners, when they're investors, the mom and pop investors, the people listening to this show that might own you know, one single family home rental or 25 single family home rentals, right? That's a mom and pop investor. Nobody surveys them to, to ask them, did your tenant pay your rent last month? Mm. They do survey the institutional uh, apartment owners though. And there are companies that this is what they do. They do surveys. They call up these institutional landlords, and a lot of them are publicly traded. A lot of them are REITs, real estate investment trusts. Right. And so they report their rent collection data. Like, you know, I, I recently featured a, a Sam Zell interview on my show, on my podcast, and, and he was talking a lot about this. And um, Sam Zell owns, uh, you know, a, a lot of residential apartment properties and a lot of office properties too. So his, his apartment or residential properties are definitely faring much better uh, than the office properties that are in shambles. And the, the uh, you know, retail properties are a disaster. The office properties are a disaster. Uh, the housing is not a disaster, but it is softening. Okay. Uh, now, I don't think that is true in the single family home market. I know it's not true with my own portfolio. My rent collections have been fine. And we have really not heard anything from any of our clients. And we've been asking uh, if they are seeing uh, problems with rent collection. And they're not. It's just not, it's not, a, it's a non-issue. Yeah, I haven't so seen far, that my properties so far. either. But uh, I'm kind of puzzled as to why. I thought I, I might see something. Maybe it's just those stimulus checks coming in from the government. So if you're on unemployment, you're getting probably more than you're making at your job. Maybe that has something to do with it. And and talk about a moral hazard. This is why employers can't get people back to work. When, yeah, when the exactly. quarantine's lifted, you know, it's like, why would I go to work if I'm getting unemployment plus an extra $600 plus when I'm at home, I have no expenses for hardly, right? You know, yeah. I, I don't have to go out to lunch. I don't have to drive to work. Uh, so my expenses are just nil. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a, you got a lot of the, I've read a lot of stories where the employees are actually pissed mm -hmm. at the employers for bringing them back. Yeah. They don't, they don't want to come back. I know it's a bad yeah, deal. They get them, pissed. Right? I mean, they're pissed. It's like, it's yeah. like a, a, a battle. It, it's yeah. just, uh, yeah, to your point, the, the the moral hazard, the unintended consequences are just limitless. Yeah, well, the 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 government, you know, the the less government interference in the marketplace, the better. Okay, but you know, we, we've just as a society, we just won't endure any pain anymore. People just don't understand that that when they're getting a stimulus check, when they're getting anything from the government, you're taking purchasing power. Right. from the future or from someone mm -hmm. it, it, that, yeah. that's the bottom line it, yeah. you, there is no free lunch you no. can't just print money give it to people have the fed or spend money give it to people have the fed monetize it and 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 not take away from someone's purchasing power either in present day or in the future it's just the way it works so I, I don't want to make this about macro. Let's go back yeah. to real estate here. One thing that you said that I thought was really interesting is about how all these people that were in these these compact urban areas mm -hmm. are now moving out to the suburbs. And that's a trend I know you predicted a couple months ago. You're seeing it play out right now. Yeah. That seems to be a trend that most likely won't reverse quickly, even if we just got a, a vaccine tomorrow. Right. It seems like that's more of a long-term trend. Can you expand on that? I think you are absolutely right. I think that is a, a generational shift. Um, I think that the desirability of living in the city has lost its, uh, lost its appeal. Um, you know, uh, I think it was on our mutual friend, Mark Moss's video. He interviewed me on his channel and, um, uh, someone I think I think on his video made a comment about, but Jason, you know, I, I own an apartment building in Brooklyn and uh, Brooklyn, New York, and you know, people want to socialize, they want to go places, and 
I, look, I agree they want that, but and I want it too. But whether they're going to get it is a different question, okay? Because think about it. Even if you live in a palatial place in a high-density area, say you have a beautiful penthouse, okay? And, you know, your life is great. You might have a private elevator. You don't take mass transit. You've got a, a $19 million penthouse in New York City. Wonderful for you. But what's the whole point of living in New York City if the restaurants are closed, if Broadway is closed? Um, you know, what? what's... Where's the attraction? That's why you pay so much to live in those places, because you have all these great entertainment and job opportunities and so forth. And and this intellectual stimulation, which is awesome, by the way, but, uh, you know, that's that's largely evaporated. And once people move to the, the burbs, the suburbs and discover that they can get a, a house that's three times the size for one third the price with a yard and a two car, car garage maybe even on five acres or something well that's not the suburbs but that's the that's rural that's the Kansas you know. city that's the suburbs well okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. all depends uh, on where you are <laughs> it depends it depends that's the burbs in kansas city in some places yes but uh you know it it really i, I think i think there's going to be a new love affair with the suburbs you know listen this is what america had after world war ii there was a love affair with the suburbs and you know it 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 shifted back to the cities the last couple of decades as a lot of people love the walkable communities which i myself love and uh, you know all of that stuff in the coffee shops and and that's super cool but i i think it's i think it's really a generational shift yeah, but what's unfortunate there is the only people that are left behind, and I'm obviously I'm generalizing here, but the 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 group of people that's left behind in these high density urban areas are the people that can't afford to move out to the suburbs. And then you get all of this social unrest, you get the rioting, the looting, and the, and then unfortunately, it's the people that are at the bottom of the totem pole from a socioeconomic standpoint that have to bear the brunt of all of that just nonsensical violence and, and destruction of private property. Yeah, I know. It's 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 really awful. Um and some of those people will get out uh and um you know they'll they'll hopefully make a new life for themselves because ultimately remember the suburbs are less expensive than the city. Okay. But you do have to make the move find the house and you know that's a chore it's a big project to do that as, especially when you aren't um as digitally capable and you don't have you know at least some resources it is harder uh, ultimately we'll see cities uh have price declines that will make them more affordable uh but it, it takes a long time for that to happen one of the reasons real estate is so uh uh, so stable as an asset class is that um, unlike the stock market, for example, where it's a very perfect market and things trade and you know exactly what the price yeah, is at any right. given time. You know, if Apple stock is trading at a hundred bucks, just for example, you know, uh, you're not going to like do better marketing and sell it for 110. You're not going <laughs> to paint it. You're exactly. not going to fix it up and say, hey, yeah. my, my Apple stock's better than George's because I, I painted it. I put some, it's got curb appeal. You know, that doesn't happen. It's a very perfect market. Real estate's very imperfect, which is good for people in the know because they can add value with these yep. imperfections and, and exploit those. Uh, but also the psychology in the mind of every market participant is a lagging indicator, a long lagging indicator. So take a, a typical seller of real estate, for example. So if, if you want to sell your house and, and you live in some neighborhood and maybe you want to get out and get to a more suburban or rural environment, you know, you might live in the suburbs now and think, well, that's not enough. I want to really get out. I'm scared of civil unrest. Yeah. I'm I'll worried about some, my own food, et cetera. Yeah. I want to be. And, and by the way, that's a good point that you bring that up. Um, you know, during the Great Depression in the 1930s, the people that you see in the in the bread lines, in the soup kitchen lines, guess what? They're all urban people. OK, right. you don't see people living in the country 
as depicted in the show, The Waltons, you know, a lot of people in the country weren't really even that affected by the Great Depression. They, they Their life was the same. It's kind of like my life hasn't changed with COVID much other than staying home. I mean, I'm still in a suburban neighborhood. I'm not worried about socially distancing. You know, it's kind of the same. And that's how it was for people in the country. They were self-sufficient. Yeah. You know, right. they, their job was working on the farm and eating the food they produced and maybe selling and trading some of that food with their neighbor farmers and, you know, doing a little bit of exporting. But farms weren't as efficient back then uh, because they didn't have all the modern equipment and modern technology like they do now. But uh, they, they weren't that affected. So So the seller psychology. So the seller is always looking in the rear view mirror. OK, and they're always thinking, OK, my neighbor sold his house for, you know, four hundred thousand dollars. And that was six months ago, pre covid, by the way, <laughs> and pre civil unrest. And, you know, my house is better than their house. Of course, it's always better because everybody thinks their house is the best. And so if they sold it for four hundred thousand, then mine's got to be worth four hundred and fifty thousand. So they put it on the market, they enter the market, and it takes a very long time for their psychology to adjust to reality. They are chasing reality and rarely catching it. And at some point they get desperate. And then they cut their price to really below market value, okay? If they would have, you know, there's an old saying, strike while the iron is hot, right? And the other old saying, you only get one chance to make a good first impression. Well, when a house enters the market and goes on the multiple listing service, that's the first impression, okay? Right. And it better be good looking, fixed up, and well priced and then it will sell most of the time lickety split if it's not then they get into the situation where it becomes stale it becomes shop worn it's chasing the market down and this brings the death spiral of real estate deflation because what happens is this person that lists their house at 450,000 when it was really uh, maybe worth 400. It was the same as their neighbors, even post COVID. Okay. Um, and maybe it was worth 400,000. Well, they end up selling it for 375 because they had to chase the market because it became stale. There was no excitement to it. And six months later, they're, they're set, settling for 375. And then the next one that sets a comp right? A comparison because residential real estate is sold by comparison. There are three uh, ways you can value real estate. The comparison approach, which is the way residential real estate is sold. The cost approach, meaning how much does it cost to replace it, to rebuild it, okay? Then there's the income approach. Most commercial real estate is sold on the income approach. You know, how much income does the property produce? Then that'll generate a cap rate, a return on investment, and that'll be the valuation metric, right? So these comps in residential real estate are very, very important. In fact, they're pretty much everything. And so when you have these sellers chasing the market down and having their psychology adjusting very, very slowly to reality, that often sets that downward spiral. But the good news is it's still a much slower uh, event than it is in the stock market or the bond market and or precious metals or cryptocurrency or pretty much anything else. Uh, so as smart, astute investors watching your show, uh, you know, we have time to react and um, and we can use this to our advantage, these these lags and delays in psychology because they work both ways. Yeah, I always tell people that or remind people that the last crash we had, we peaked out in 2006. We didn't bottom out till 2012. So you know, to your point, and that that was a, a, a obviously a extremely severe housing crisis and crash. So um, th there's a lot that would have to happen that would be just um, out on the margin, that would be an extreme event, a really uh, you know tail risk event that was almost unexpected, like a black swan type of thing, even above and beyond what's happened with the, the virus to make real estate, the entire market drop in like, you know, six months or a year. I mean, that 
that, that is almost uh, unimaginable. Not that it's not possible, but it's probably not extremely probable. And then I like to remind people that the market can always go down in real terms, while at the same time it's going up or staying consistent in nominal terms. So you've always yeah, got to yeah. look at it in inflation adjusted. Absolutely. Good point. George, I got to ask you, I know you said you didn't want to talk about macro, but I want to ask you because I, I haven't asked you this in a couple of months. Uh, is the future inflationary or deflationary? <laughs> well, it depends on what you're looking at. And so in my opinion, I think that in the United States domestically, you're going to see consumer prices increase. So the stuff that you buy on a daily basis, whether it's food, I, I think uh, the, the medical care, uh, education, just unfortunately, the things that, that real people buy, right. uh, those prices will go up where the items that you might use credit for, mm -hmm. like a, a very high end vehicle. Yeah, I think those prices will most likely fall. There's going to be a lot less demand for that. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that the high end housing market would have come down as well because people are, are just a lot less or they're a lot more apprehensive about taking on a lot of debt in this type of environment where their job is a, a complete unknown. So uh, maybe it's just that the supply is is so low because it's so very few low. people are yeah. selling that even though the demand side of the equation drops, mm -hmm. the supply side of the equation has dropped even faster with houses and therefore, we haven't seen a, a big price decline. But that's how I see it playing out. There's no yep. certainties. There's only probabilities, right? Uh, especially with the TGA. And I don't know if we, you and I have discussed that, but that's the, the Treasury General account that's held mm -hmm. at the Federal Reserve. They have allowed that to get up to $1.6 trillion. To give you some context, prior to the GFC, that would hover between 2 and $5 billion. Okay, so this this was back in two thousand seven ish. Yeah, prior to the okay. prior to two thousand eight, it would hover between okay. uh, two and five billion with a B. Now and, it's and now one, it's trillion. <laughs> one point six trillion. Oh my god! So what what that is is that's the Treasury's bank account, and they can spend that into the economy whenever they choose. So they could spend one point six trillion into the economy literally within a matter of two weeks. So you say, okay, well, why is that a big deal? Because that does the exact same thing as quantitative easing from the standpoint is it increases bank reserves. But additionally, it increases the amount of deposits or M2 money supply in the real economy. Mm -hmm. So we think about QE3. That was $80 billion per month. So they've got this war chest coming into the election where they could spend $1.6 trillion in a month and oh. think about what that would do yeah. to the prices of goods and services it, because in, we're in, in Georgia, a situation yeah. where the supply side you know the supply of goods and services it's just like housing right. now it's for different reasons but the supply chains are getting crunched businesses are going bust so the supply of goods and services decreases 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 right. while at the same time you've got the treasury blowing a trillion dollars that makes M2 money supply just go parabolic. Right. And, yeah. and then you ask, you have to ask the question, well, what is usually the result or what is usually the catalyst of extreme social unrest? And if you look through history, generally it's one of two things. Number one, when the government removes a subsidy that's been there for the general public for uh, austerity decades, measure. Yeah. Uh, something like that. Or when food prices go through the roof. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the Arab Spring, you know, we might have the, the, the United States summer. Yeah. Something like that. Well, so, food, food that, grocery prices are at a five decade high right now. I mean, right now, grocery grocery prices are at a 50 year high. Adjusted it's, for inflation? Yeah. Well, um, yes. Adjusted for inflation, of course. Yes. Yeah, wow, that's crazy. And I know they've just... I mean, spiked. adjusted for the official inflation rate, not the real inflation rate. Right, we, so, so they're both, even no. higher. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, they're even higher, yes. Yeah, yeah, so think about what that's doing in pinching people's budgets, while at the same time, we have all of these people in the workforce mm -hmm. that would that should be working in the service sector 
and are not working and they're just getting by right now we're keeping up that demand because they've got these stimulus checks but now that's becoming a subsidy that the whole entire system is becoming reliant upon yep. so good luck when july or whenever it's supposed to expire when, when that there's no way they're, they're going to come out with another round of stimulus and then you, if you want to talk about unintended consequences i don't know if you saw those articles from cnbc but a lot of people took their stimulus checks and their yeah, increased unemployment. Yeah. well they went right to the stock they market they set up a they robin, robin hood account yeah, I know. and they weird. start buying hertz or they start buying Nikola or some company that is bankrupt, like Chesapeake or something like that. Nice. I mean, think about the misallocation of resources right there, where Talk you remember that. that every single dime they're getting in stimulus is purchasing power that's being stolen from the future or someone currently. I mean, it's just, it, it, it completely boggles the mind. So. That, that's what I've got to say right now on macro. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it is crazy. And, you know, uh, when when we, we are already seeing high grocery prices, thanks, thankfully, gas prices are low. Yeah. And right. that's keeping a lid to some extent on grocery prices. They'd be higher if yep. we were looking at four dollar a gallon gasoline. I mean, th people would be in real, real trouble, especially if they had to commute, okay, which a lot of them aren't doing right now. How are uh, mortgage rates right now for homeowners and investors? And then what about the ease of credit? Is it getting harder to get a loan? Is it just as easy? What are you seeing on your side? Good question. I'll answer that. But I want to just make one more comment on your subsidy uh, sure. point, because you talked about the civil unrest throughout history and it's it's high consumer prices, especially food. OK, and it's and it's take austerity measures like you saw that in Greece. We've seen that in many places around the world. We've even seen it in, in England. OK, and, uh, you know, people will riot in the streets over inflation and over uh, taking away the government goodies, the handouts, right? And so uh, it, it just reminded me of that Milton Friedman quote, there's nothing so permanent as a temporary government program. That's right. You just can't take this stuff away. The people won't, won't, you know, I mean, it's like a kid, right? If you, if you give a kid something or you give, you know, my, like my dog, right? If I give him something, I'm not getting it back. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, they're very possessive. Okay. And, uh, and, and that's, that's kind of the way it is, you know? So, um, your question, uh, mortgage rates, first yeah, of all, I, for homeowners and investors, yeah, they, and then ease of credit. Is it, is it still pretty easy to get a loan? Is it getting harder? What are you seeing with your investors? Yeah, yeah. The the Mortgage Bankers Association, otherwise known as the MBA, publishes uh, the MCAI, the Mortgage Credit Availability Index. I know that's a mouthful. And um, about about three to four weeks in to the sort of the worst part of of COVID, uh, mortgage credit availability started just massively tightening. Mm -hmm. where the banks were just being very fearful. It has loosened slightly since then, but it is way down. So availability of credit is very much restricted. Now, interest rates, and when you say interest rates, you know, what interest rate is the question, right? You know, is you know it, mortgage rates more it, specifically. Yeah, mortgage rates is what you're asking about, but interest rates in general are really at a 3,000 year low. Okay. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. And you, you do some great stuff on, on your videos where you look back at long history, which is really gives things a much better context. Uh, but mortgage rates are very good. They're excellent. Um, and uh, it's a great time to get a mortgage if you can get one. It's not only the bank tightening the mortgage credit availability index issue. It's also just a practical issue of these mortgage companies being so busy. It, you can't get any service. You can't get any attention. It's hard to get a return phone call. I mean, and, and just remember something. If you're a real estate investor, uh, the, the more hoops you have to jump through to be an investor, meaning it's harder to get a mortgage, it's harder to get any service out of your mortgage representative, um, then that that limits the playing field. It, it makes it more exclusive because a lot of 
potential home buyers that are now renting won't jump through all those hoops or can't jump through all those hoops. And so you have something that is harder to get for others and that, that puts upward pressure on your rents. So that's good for you. Yeah. So how are these mortgage companies so busy? If, if the supply of housing stock is down. Refi boom. Oh, oh I see. there's a giant where the whole country's refinancing. It's crazy. Uh, and, and, and the supply has come back a little bit and it is just being gobbled up everywhere you look. You know, it's just not enough inventory. I mean, look, there's been a housing inventory shortage for really six years now. OK, and this has made it dramatically worse. So we've got to see the government loosen the restrictions and make it easier to build things. And this is really up to local governments to do this, to lighten up on the zoning a little bit, to let, you know, to be a little more liberal on zoning so people can build things, to be a little less burdensome as to the construction quality, the, you know, the, the low flush toilets, the low flow shower heads, the environmental restrictions, you know, you got to have a smoke detector, so many of them, you got to have carbon monoxide, detect you know, you got to have uh, everything built to a certain spec that just, that just makes more homelessness is what it does. Okay. Yeah, and I want to be clear. And I, I want to be clear there with what Jason is saying when he talks about just reducing the amount of red tape and, yeah. and building codes and whatnot. Listen, I, I, I've done this stuff. I've, as you guys know, I've remodeled a ton of homes. I've actually done new builds in the United States. And you could get rid of 50% of the building codes in the United States, and it wouldn't affect the quality of the home or safety standards at all, like, like, like zero. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's not like you're saying, Oh, go out there and make some shoddy houses that are going to fall apart. Right, right, it, it's yeah. just, it's taking off all the fat from these regulations and red tape that really are totally unnecessary and redundant. Right. And remember a lot of the regulations and red tape and these laws that got into place in any part of our society, not just home building, um, you know, mortgage rules, Dodd-Frank that came about post-Great Recession, you know, this 2,200-page bill that nobody can understand and, you know, gives the government another reason to go and hunt people down and prosecute them for violating some obscure law they nobody can understand, right? Uh, and, you know, all of this red tape, uh, much of it came about by, number one, someone, some politician trying to make a name for themselves, a career for themselves right. as a supposed do-gooder, right? Yeah. Or yeah. a lobbyist, okay? And, and a lobbyist lobbied the politician, gave them the brown paper bag of money or some sort of quid pro quo that basically said, you know, hey, if if you know if you uh, if you push this through, if you vote for this bill, then you know we can do something for you over here, right? And yeah. uh, so, as an example, the the lobbyists would go to the politician and say, "Hey, we need you to make a rule that you need twice as much insulation going into the walls or the roofs, or they'll give them some chart to make it look good." But they're just representing the person who's selling the insulation. Well, they'll usually do that under the uh, under the guise of the environment, and they'll oh, say, right. "Well, you right. know, we're we're going to save energy," and you know, they'll you know commission all these studies. A lot of them are bogus, just like they are in the global warming debate, and you know, the the pharmaceutical industry, and they'll commission a bunch of studies, and you know, get a bunch of fake experts to say this or that, and. You know that uh, yeah, it's it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, really. it all goes back to corruption. Yeah, but how did we ever get to this point in the world? You know, George, the thing is, look at we all will agree that government is, uh, by and large, corrupt and inefficient. Okay, I mean, you know, we need government, right? I'm I'm not an anarchist, but you know, if we want to reduce the corruption and the inefficiency, the one sure way we can do it is to just shrink the size of the beast. Just the federal government. Simple. That's right. The they lobbyists are gone. Every, every it would solve so many problems. Why would there be corporate uh, corporatism or yeah. crony capitalism? 
that you, you wouldn't have that. None of these corporations would be going to Washington, D.C. to try to get all these favors to get an advantage over their competitors if the federal government didn't have the power to do that in the first place. If you just if we shrank government down to call it 10 percent of GDP back where it was even you know before the 1930s, I mean, you would solve a laundry list of problems. I mean, I would go so far as to say probably 90, 95 percent of the problems outside of the, the monetary problems we have right now and the uh, financial industry problems we have with the Fed. But as far as just the, the real economy, boy, that would work wonders. Yeah, it would. It would. Look, at the, the beast is inefficient and corrupt. We all know that. Uh, on both sides of the aisle, you know, really nobody disagrees with that. Uh, so if you want to just reduce the size of the corruption and the inefficiency, just shrink the whole thing and it'll shrink proportionately. You yeah. know, that's the only answer. I totally agree. All right, buddy, we've gone almost an hour. I really appreciate your time. Uh, one thing we forgot to talk about that I think is really exciting is your virtual kind yes. of conference that yes, we have yes. coming up called yeah. Meet the Masters. Can you tell yep. us about that real quick and then yes. tell us where we can go to find out more about it? Sure, sure. So this is a uh, an event that we've held live 21 times. So this is the 22nd anniversary of our Meet the Masters of Income Property Conference. We've had Ron Paul speak at this conference. We've had uh, uh, real estate uh, guru John Burns. We've had um, Danielle, Danielle DiMartino Martino Booth. Booth. Yes, we had her. Uh, we had um, George Gilder. Oh, he was brilliant last year. He spoke. Uh, we've just had a bunch of great speakers and a bunch of experts. So we have the kind of the speaker class, and, and that's who we mentioned there, and there's a bunch more. And then we also have the um the, like the internal team the property managers the local market specialist the boots on the ground people our investment counselors our lenders uh experts on things like self-directed iras 1031 tax deferred exchanges um cpas lawyers talk about asset protection all of this stuff and we combine this into a weekend event uh again this is our 22nd anniversary and this is the first time we're doing it virtually virtually. And George, I'll tell you something. I am really excited about having a virtual event. Uh, of course, <laughs> it's much easier for everybody. Right. We've had people fly in for this event. Last year, we had someone come from Perth, Australia to Newport Beach, California. He took a 22-hour flight and came to our event, turned around and went back. He just wanted to see that. We've had people fly in from uh, Japan, from other places in Asia, from Europe, uh, from the Middle East to this event over the years. OK, and uh, now it's virtual. So the only thing you have to encounter if you're somewhere else in the world is time zone. <laughs> we can't fix that. Uh, time zones are time zones. But uh, just uh, just look at it like you're, you're jet lagged. But the great thing about it, too, is we have access to better talent, to better speakers, because they don't have to fly either. So this year we have Harry Dent speaking, and we have none other than George Gammon, who is speaking. <laughs> and I think he's going well, to I talk heard that about that guy's fantastic. He's great, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and and I heard he's going to talk about, I hope he does a presentation on how the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is the biggest scam in history because it is. And yeah. uh, I, I, I can't wait to hear your presentation on that. And I think you got something else up your sleeve, too. Yeah, it's going to so, be a lot of fun. OK, so where can they go to find out more about it, Jason? Uh, JasonHartman.com slash masters. JasonHartman.com slash masters. And you can get tickets for that. And probably by the time this is published, we'll have tickets for sale. And just as a reminder for everyone who's a member of Rebel Capitalist Pro, we're going to be doing a live stream Q&A this Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Jason, thank you again, buddy. Hey, my pleasure. Happy investing to you and your viewers and listeners. 